Historical Society. Uh, my name is Chris Jepson and I'm the current president of the Society and uh, we're glad to have you all here with us this evening. Um, I see a lot of familiar faces. I also see a lot of uh, new faces uh, here tonight. And um, you know, I figure Irvine's a popular place and it's going to be a popular uh, topic. So um, if you are not a, uh, currently a member, I just want to tell you we do this once a month, a different topic relating to Orange County's history. We've been doing this uh, since 1919 and we plan to keep doing it. Um, and it's, um, if you're interested in joining, we have our meetings, we have uh, history hikes and tours and other events. Um, we have a big annual dinner, which I'll be talking about a little later. Um, and we have a variety of other programs throughout the year. So, uh, if you are interested, um, we, uh, you can sign up. Uh, we have copies of the newsletter back there and membership forms uh, all at uh, both tables in the back. Um, and uh, the, so, <laughs> there are uh, discounts on events and uh, we will also stop, if you're a non-member, we won't, uh, if you are a member, we won't bug you about the $5 donation at the door at our meetings either. So there's another, another perk. Um, you know, oh, by the way, I just want to point out, I am wearing Master Homeowners Association approved tans and beiges tonight for the meeting to go with the Irvine theme. Um, also wanted to point out, we have, um, uh, our books, some of our books are for sale in the, in the back there, and uh, <laughs> we have uh, also um, a variety of California crate labels for sale back there. So you might want to go through those if you're a collector or interested in decorating the home or office. There's some, there's some really nice ones uh, in there. So I um, <laughs> wanted to announce our annual dinner is coming up on June 8th. Uh, it will be at the Springfield Banquet Center, which was the former Fullerton Masonic Temple, built in 1920. It's a beautiful historic building, Spanish colonial revival. And uh, we'll have a, a social hour, silent auction and cash bar at 5.30, dinner at 6.30, what we're calling our Americana Buffet. And uh, the presentation will be at 7.30, and uh, our speaker is author, educator, and TV personality, George Geary, who will discuss California-born diners, burger joints, restaurants, and fast food that changed America. Uh, California has long been at the forefront of uh, food, and car culture and our fast pace of living resulted in fast food restaurants, coffee shops, diners, um, and other casual chains. Most were born of these chains, you know, so many of these chains were born in Southern California, some were born in Orange County, and a lot of them that weren't born in Orange County quickly decided they wanted to make their home base here in Orange County. So we've got a lot of connections. So this will be a chance to learn about the entrepreneurs, the buildings, and the food that made these places famous. Um, the event is $65 for members, $75 for non-members, another reason to join. Um, and uh, if you are interested, uh, check out, we have flyers at the table near the entrance with all the details. So uh, I encourage you to pick one of those up if you haven't already. Uh, <clears throat> without, uh, I'd like to go ahead and introduce our speaker. Uh, former Irvine Company executive Mike Stockstill is co-author of a very valuable new book, and I do mean uh, I'm not, I don't mean it's expensive, I just mean it's a valuable thing to have on your shelf if you care about local history. And it is expensive. <laughs> it's, um, <coughs> the Irvine, uh, Transforming the Irvine Ranch, Joan Irvine, William Pereira, Ray Watson, and the Big Plan. Uh, Stockstill is a native Californian, he graduated from Humboldt State University in 1971 with a degree in journalism. He moved to Orange County in 1972 where he worked for newspapers and magazines before joining the Irvine Company in 1978. After leaving the Irvine Company in 1991, he worked with a variety of public affairs positions before retiring in 2010. He and his wife remain residents of Irvine today, a true believer. <laughs> so uh, one of the benefits of my day job is I do get to see people coming 
through and I get to see who's doing real research and, and really digging and spending the time and looking under, looking, uh, looking uh, high and low for, for whatever else they can find to add value to their work. And, and I can definitely attest you know, to, to you being uh, doggedly determined to, to do a great job with this. So um, with that, I, uh, I will get out of the way. And thank you for joining us. Thanks, Dr. Thank you. Chris, uh, I'm here on behalf of myself and my co-author. His name's Pike Oliver. He lives in uh, Phoenix. And before beginning formally, if you haven't had a chance, please come up and look at our exhibits. We kind of go chronologically from left to right. We have a number of maps of the Irvine Ranch, photos of people who uh, were um, uh, individuals who had a big impact on the ranch. And then we finish up with a picture of uh, Al Taubman, who was part of the group that purchased the Irvine Ranch in 1977. Uh, let me also introduce a fellow historian, a guy I've known for, God, about 40 years, Stan Offaly. Stanley, where are you? There he is back there. Stan is, Stan is the author of a great book called uh, Shaping Orange County, uh, a fabulous history, and Stan gets into some um, parts of Orange County history that it took a lot of nerve to write about. So uh, I commend Stan for doing that, and, and I suggest you get his book as well. So our book is Transforming the Irvine Ranch. Joan Irvine, William Pereira, Ray Watson, and the Big Plan. The other thing I'd like you to do, if you are interested, this is a copy of William Pereira and Associates' 1961 plan for the Irvine Ranch. Uh, we obtained it accidentally, and it's a true piece of history. Ultimately, we'll probably end up donating it to um, the um, uh, library and special collections at UCI, where I spent a lot of time uh, working on this book. So what I found living in Orange County since 1972 is that most people here in the county know something about either the Irvine Ranch or the Irvine family or the Irvine Company, bits and pieces. Our book is really the first comprehensive history of the major events that took place from 1947, the year James Irvine II died, to 1977, the year that the James Irvine Foundation sold their shares in the Irvine Company. And we emphasize 17 years, 1960 to 1917. So like any good history lesson, let's start with some dates. First date, 1876. James Irvine I, who had become rich during the California Gold Rush, buys out his two partners in a land deal that gives him total control of 110,000 acres of land in the center of Orange County, the Irvine Ranch. 1894. His son, James Irvine II, who inherited the ranch after his father's death, incorporates his holdings as the Irvine Company, and he names himself president. James Irvine II was best known as J.I. James Irvine II built the Irvine Ranch into an agricultural empire. It had citrus, it had field crops, cattle, he drilled wells, he built dams, and he employed hundreds of people. Newspapers of the day refers, referred to him as the lima bean king because that crop was so abundant on the Irvine Ranch. But J.I.'s life was really filled with tragedy, including the untimely death of his first wife, his daughter dying shortly after childbirth, and his eldest son dying. Fast forward, 1947. J.I. dies while he's fishing on the Flying D Ranch in Montana. He was 79 years old. And in 2023 dollars, his estate is worth more than $200 million. He's a very, very wealthy man. In addition to land holdings here, he owned buildings, office buildings all over uh, Southern California. He owned a ranch in Moraga, up in Contra Costa County. Um, very successful investor. J.I. wanted the Irvine Ranch to remain as a single land holding. And to promote that outcome, 10 years before, he death, or before his death, he 
he created the James Irvine Foundation. And in his will, he gave the foundation 54% of his stock in the Irvine Company, a controlling interest. The remaining stock was in the hands of members of the Irvine family. That decision set the stage for a very colorful and controversial history of the Irvine Ranch that we describe in our book. Now let's look at the lives of the three people who we feature in our title, Joan Irvine, William Pereira, and Ray Watson. Joan Irvine was the granddaughter of James Irvine II. He willed her 20% of his shares of the Irvine Company when he died. That was more than any other family member. Joan was raised in wealth and in privilege, but as a child, she also spent a lot of time with her grandfather, and like him, she came to love the land. I believe Joan Irvine viewed the Irvine Ranch as her birthright, which led her to more than 20 years of conflict when she tried to gain control of the Irvine Company. Joan led a very colorful life. Let me read you an excerpt from our book that talks about her honeymoon with her second husband. It was a flyer who became Joan's next husband, Russell S. Penniman III, four years her senior. Penniman had flown fighter jets in the Korean War for the U.S. Navy. Their honeymoon, which stretched for seven months, made news in the July 22, 1957 issue of Sports Illustrated under the headline, Sporting Start for a Marriage, a lengthy story chronicled their flying adventure in South America. Planning for the honeymoon, Joan told the magazine, I wanted to do things that other people would never think about. I wanted to live it up. Responding to his new bride's desires, Penniman created a plan for them to fly his Cessna 180 to South America and back. Altogether, Sports Illustrated reported, they logged 30,000 flying miles and made hundreds more by canoe, on horseback, and by foot. Along the way, they danced in Mexican nightclubs, collected three monkeys, hunted on the plains of Argentina, fished for marlin in Cabo Blanco, and stuffed themselves on exotic food like grilled armadillo and roast ostrich. On the trip, the Penimans landed at no more than 75 places, setting down on any paved airport or muddy landing strip that promised adventure. At Acapulco, Jane tried her, tried her first water skis, and in the Andes, she floundered like any other novice on her snow skis. But flying was the biggest thrill for Joan, who got her license just before the trip and split the flying char uh, chores with her husband. Some people in here knew jo Joan Irvine Smith. How many show of hands? You were okay. bad. I met her. You met her? Everybody has a Joan Irvine Smith story, I've learned. She was quite a woman. Uh, Joan was married four times. And we know her best by her final name, which was Joan Irvine Smith. Now William Pereira, an architect and a planner, Pereira was the seminal figure in the creation of UCI and in the city of Irvine. He was charismatic and he had a powerful presence. Ray Watson said he was the best salesman he'd ever seen. And Ray said it was persu Pereira's persuasive abilities that united the Irvine family, the company, and the University of California to create UC Irvine. Interesting fact, William Pereira won an Academy Award. He was an art director at Paramount Pictures before he became the architect and the planner that we know him today. Now Ray Watson. Ray grew up in a boarding house in Oakland with his grandmother and his father. His is a classic Horatio Alger story, a young man who works hard, studies hard, and he succeeds. Ray was an architect by profession, but he was also a man with a very keen intellect and a very inquisitive mind. That led him to view planning and architecture as more than just buildings. Ray wanted to build entire communities, and in 1960, he got that opportunity when he was hired as a junior planner at the Irvine Company. Let me read a description of life in the boarding house. And this is important because Ray referred to this for his whole life, and it really shaped who he was. These are Ray, Ray's words. The people who lived there in the boarding house, well, they were hard of luck. 
They couldn't live anywhere else, but I didn't know that then. My grandmother, who was into her 70s, she's running this house all by herself. And one of her obligations, she didn't cook meals for the boarders, but she did their sheets and their towels without a washing machine. So that means a scrub board in the bathtub. I can remember her to this day, scrubbing those sheets. Raina's sister worked there too, sweeping carpets and stairs, polishing the handrails. The handrails, they're paid 10 cents a week. Oakland was an experience tinged with, tinged with some sadness for Watson. Because the family moved often, he never had any neighborhood roots, a place where he had friends to play with. Nor was there much time for the rights of a boy's teenage years, a pickup baseball or basketball game, or hanging out in the neighborhood with his peers. Watson's memories are largely of working around the boarding house to put the laundry out, I had a washing machine by then, two paper routes, and during the summer, a job in a cannery. And my guess is, based on the research I did, he was getting about 15 cents an hour. I worked 12 hour days, six days a week, he said. I felt rich. Now I'm gonna describe what Ray Watson found when he started work in 1960 at the Irvine family home, which, is, which burned down and is now uh, rebuilt as the Katie Wheeler Library on Irvine Boulevard. That was Irvine Company headquarters at what used to be uh, Myford Road near the I-5. So imagine you're driving from Los Angeles, you're heading south, you pass through Santa Ana, you come to Tustin Ranch Road in 1960. And what do you see? On your left, citrus trees covering the hills. Ahead of you and on your right, nothing. Flat land, 50,000 acres of beans, vegetables, some cattle, things like that. That was it. There were no houses. There's no UCI. 50,000 acres of row crops in 1960. Now imagine you're in Newport Beach. Newport was a town in 1960 of just about 26,000 people. There's no Newport Center, no Fashion Island. So you're driving south and you're just about to leave Corona Del Mar, and what do you see? Again, nothing. This is the Irvine coast, four miles long, and with the exception of a few cottages down at Crystal Cove and some trailers at Morrow, uh, Morrow Beach, there's nothing there. This was the biggest undeveloped piece of land in Southern California with the exception of Camp Pendleton. So again, 1960, I think most of us in this room were alive at that point. It's just astounding. People just don't understand what was not here more than what was here. Ray found this challenge of planting this huge empty property exhilarating. He spent the next 17 years of his life working as a planner and an executive, and in 1974, he became the president of the Irvine Company. All the places I just mentioned, UCI, Fashion Island, Newport Center, plus East Bluff, University Park, Turtle Rock, and the first part of Woodbridge, all were planned and built in those 17 years. It's an incredible achievement. Ray died in 2012, but he left behind two very long oral histories, and he wrote six chapters of a book that he planned to write on his experiences during those 17 years. Ray's writing and his oral history really formed the foundation of our book. And to people who knew Ray, I say, this is Ray's book, because he really wanted to write this. Three other significant elements that we cover in our book also took place from 1960 to 77. The first is the decision of the University of California to locate on the Irvine Ranch, and how by doing so, it shaped the city of Irvine and influenced many other parts of Orange County. I'll tell you a quick story. Pat Brown, when he would come to Orange County, would, would always start if it was the right kind of a group. And I heard him say this in person. He said, you know, 
When I was elected governor in 1958, I won every county in this state except Orange County. <laughs> so I thought we'd better put a university here to educate those people and get <laughs> them to learn. <laughs> True story. I heard those words from Pat Brown's mouth. Well, it wasn't quite that. It was a great story, but the plans for the University of California had started in the mid-50s. So they were well underway, and Pat Brown may or may not have wanted it on the Irvine Ranch. That's kind of disputed. So the first decision, the big decision, locating the University of California, and that was, that was not a slam dunk. Nor was the second, the incorporation of the city of Irvine. Fifty years ago, that took place. There was a lot of legal backroom wheeling and dealing to get the, the city of Irvine incorporated. And uh, we have some great uh, memories of that, from, particularly from a guy named Tim Strader Sr., who was the attorney for the group of uh, people that were incorporating. The third element that really had an impact on, on, the, <clears throat> excuse me, on this is the passage of the Tax Reform Act of 1969. That forced the James Irvine Foundation to sell its holdings in the Irvine Company, which they did in 1977, in a public auction. A lot of you in the room probably remember that. Joan Irvine Smith was in the middle of all these issues. She did not want a corporation in the city of Irvine for reasons I've never been able to determine. And Joan was probably the key player, aside from William Pereira, in forcing or convincing the Irvine family and foundation to give the thousand acres of land to UCI for one dollar. Joan saw what had happened to UCLA and she said, this will be a great thing for us. Our book ends with the stories of the men who bought the Irvine Company in 1977 and Joan Irvine. She was part of the team. They were Alfred Taubman, he was a retail developer. Max Fisher, Henry Ford II, Milton Petri, Howard Margulis, and he came in late, but he was part of the team, Donald Brown. You may know that the purchase took place in a public bidding session with Taubman's team competing against Mobile Oil and the Canadian firm of Cadillac Fairview. Our book has perhaps the most comprehensive account of the behind the scenes battle thanks to long interviews with a man who was Taubman's field general on the ground. His name's Bob Scout. Let me just read you part of this. Taubman called Scout and told him to enter a bid of $225 million cash plus additional compensation in the form of lease exchanges. That brought the total to $285.6 million. The problem was time. The bid was due at Orange County Air, uh, Courthouse at 3 p.m., and Taubman had called shortly before noon. An official form required to enter the bid document was only available in Los Angeles at a law office. But Scout was prepared. He had a helicopter waiting at Orange County Airport. <laughs> a series of events worthy of a Keystone Cops movie began with Scout as an associate climbing into the chopper, making a beeline for downtown. However, the pilot and scout had neglected to find a place to land. They spotted a landing pad at the top of the building. Alighting, they were met by a group of armed guards who were there to protect Occidental Petroleum owner, Arm and Hammer. A conversation ensued. Money changed hands. The scout and the pilot remained on the roof while his associate went on foot to Friedman's office and grabbed the paperwork. Now it was a race to Orange County. With nowhere to land in downtown Santa Ana, the pilot recalled a friend who owned a Porsche dealership in Anaheim where there was a large parking lot they could land. And he'd have a car waiting, the pilot told Scott. <laughs> Once on the ground, the friend and promised car were missing. With the deadline looming, Scout clambered over a six-foot fence and located a car in the lot with keys in the ignition. He raced to the courthouse, ran to the front door, I had no idea where to go, but then I saw Joan standing in the doorway of the court hearing room. Scout delivered the highest bid submitted to the court that day with no time to spare. Bob Scout says it's true and I believe. 
We were also able to examine at the James Irvine Foundation offices in San Francisco the actual minutes of the James Irvine Foundation for that time period. They revealed, to my knowledge, things that have never been made public before, and they're really a unique element in our book. And we're very thankful for the Irvine Foundation allowing us to do that. They've been great supporters. In addition to using Ray Watson's writings, we interviewed about 40 people, many of them former Irvine Company consultants uh, and employees. And we were able to do research uh, documents from libraries here in California and Michigan to add to the details. If you look at the book, you'll see we're very well researched and very well footnoted. As uh, Chris noted, uh, I was in the archives one day. I found a deed signed by James Irvine II. That was a real thrilling moment for me. Let me conclude by just reading a couple of paragraphs at the end of our book. It was a relatively young group of professionals who'd been asked to tackle the monumental assignment of creating a new community on thousands of acres of farmlands and orchards. Ray Watson was just 34 when he arrived, joining men like Al Trevino, 28, Lanny Eberling, who was 26, Warren Fix, 24, and Don Cameron, who was 28. Bill Mason who was kind of the old guy, he was 41. <laughs> in his oral history and his writings, Watson mentions more than once that the challenge before the group was something that none of them had ever faced in their young careers. However, moderating the challenge was the opportunity a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity, as Watson explained to his wife, they would never, it would never be duplicated. It would never happen again. They were also, in large part, a team with no history to constrain them, no hidebound traditions, no rule books, no artificial standards to stand in the way of creative thinking. Watson notes that a lot of untried concepts were examined, rejected, tried, considered, said we were working for a company that had no idea how to build a new city. In the end, for these men, the challenges and hurdles drew them together and forged a common purpose. It was a joy to come to work every day, Lanny Eberling remembers, because we were doing something important. We were on a quest. And it would be a quest like no other, with results like no other, the transformation of the Irvine Ranch. Be happy to take questions. Yes, sir. Do you happen to know the percentage of open land that we still have in Orange County today because of Irvine? I know that Mr. Bren donated <clears throat> 11,000 acres of land that's open space, and there's additional land where Crystal Cove is. The Irvine Company sold that to the state. And there's also an area around the toll road that is set aside as open space. So 20, 25,000 acres maybe? Just a guess. I heard a percentage in the, they took the OC volunteer training and they, some crazy percentage of land that's still open because of the Irvine Company. Well, uh, yeah, in terms of the Irvine Company, the 11,000, I'm really yeah. sure about that. The sale of the land along the coast was maybe another four or eight, so best guess. Thanks. Other questions? Yes? Uh, this lot that you're talking about, is that a good part of the family that got the Rancho uh, Dominion? No, different different person entirely. Different lot. Yeah. All yeah. Yeah, that's the Watson Land Company and no relation to Ray Watson. Other questions? Yes? Because Watson talked about uh, their architectural influences in the development of Irvine. Ray Watson was an architect and Ray insisted, <laughs> executive vice president for land development, that every development, every village had an architect on the team. So they oversaw the design. So that was very important. Um, he also, and the company also, emphasized architectural diversity. They hired different architects. They didn't want the village to look like just 
one architect had designed it. So architecture, both um, built architecture and landscape architecture were very important. Uh, if you drive up Culver Drive in Irvine and you look at Woodbridge, you can't see inside. And that was a, 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 a decision that was made so that it would kind of force the village internally. It also kept noise out. So uh, if you look at Irvine and you look at the fine detail, every village kind of has its own look. In Woodbridge, it's the stone and wood. In West Park, it's more Mediterranean, obviously. So long answer, but yes, architecture was very important. Other questions? Yes? Do they anticipate all the traffic that Yes. <laughs> Two things about that. One, if you look at the Irvine Ranch Master Plan, you'll see that there's some very, very substantial streets kind of running north and south, if you will. It takes a half hour to get from the freeway. It does. Um, if you look at Woodbridge, there, the internal streets there kind of allow, if you're in the neighborhoods, you don't have to think about being in. Huntington Beach or Garden Grove, I'm not picking on them, but think about how those places are arrayed. There are streets from here and every street connects to each other, other street. That's not the case in most villages in Irvine. You go in a single place and then you go internally. So it forces. So that circular, I mean, I, when I drive into Irvine, it's yes. like circular, I get lost. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes I get lost in the middle of the street. Yeah. Yeah. That's part of the design. That's exactly right. That's part of the design. Are there other cities that are planned like that? To a degree, Santa Margarita is. I'll tell you the other part. The other part about traffic is in the early days, prayer in particular was really big on well, we're going to create dense areas and we're going to make it so people can walk. I, I tell people the car won in Orange County. It's just for as much as effort as planners went into it. And there are places in Irvine you can ride your bike from one place to the other. I can walk from my house along a trail to CVS. But in terms of what was really seen or wanted, you have to have a lot of density to have transit work, and we just never had it. Uh, yes, sir, here. And, uh, today, the Irvine Company gets a lot of uh, deserved credit for setting aside uh, so much land for uh, preservation, open space, uh, some of it managed by the Irvine Ranch Conservancy. Mm -hmm. There's also, on the other hand, the matter of Upper Newport Bay, where if I remember the details correctly, there was a lot of legal wrangling and it was eventually uh, the preservation one because uh, some <coughs> islands in the Upper Bay worked uh, included in the original Spanish uh, uh, ranch allotment. I may have that screwed up, but maybe you could talk to that a little bit. We have a whole chapter in the book talk, talking about Upper Newport Bay, and it was written, about 85% of it was written by Ray Watson. So the point of view is from Ray and from uh, the Irvine Company. But we give great credit and rightful credit to Frank and Francis Robinson, mm -hmm. who were really the two people that rode kind of the wave of environmentalism that was coming and wanted the Upper Newport Bay to be um, what it is today, not developed. If you go back all the way back into the history, the County of Orange in the 1930s identified the Upper Newport Bay for development into a marina. It was going to be like the Lower Bay, which was dredged down and used for you know boating as we see now. The war, the depression got in the way, and in the 50s, the county kind of began again. They came to the company and said, look, why don't we put this together? Pereira, when he did his master plan for UCI, looked at the bay and said, oh, this would be a great place for uh, athletics, for a crew um, facility. So the idea was it was going to be a recreational facility. A couple of things happened. The first was, Times had changed. The Santa Barbara oil spill happened. Earth Day had happened. Everything was shifting. Politics in Orange County had shifted. The Board of Supervisors had turned over. And what used to be a three to two vote in favor of the Irvine Company now was the other way. We had supervisors who were not 
um, friendly to the Irvine Company. So all that was kind of bubbling beneath the surface as the time came and Francis Robinson looked in the paper and said, gee, they're going to develop the bay. Well, our kids play there. We don't want that to happen. That started a multi-year effort. If you read Ray Watson's stuff, about two years into this, it became clear to the people in the Irvine Company, we're going to lose this. We've just got to figure a way to get out of this. And so lawsuits ensued. Ultimately, the Irvine Company prevailed in the ability to actually build, but they knew there was no support for it. It was not going to fly. So ultimately, the land was sold to the uh, state of California <clears throat> as a wildlife preserve. Another gentleman, I don't remember his name, as this was all concluding, found some maps of the islands. If you've been to the upper bay, when the tide goes down, there's little islands scattered through. Uh, he said, I have proof that those islands are public property. They should have never been given to the, or the they should have never belonged to the Irvine Company, and therefore uh, we shouldn't have to pay for this. The company responded, well, we've been paying property taxes on these things since 1900. Um, <laughs> we're not going to give them away, and the sale then proceeded. But if you're really interested in the special collections at UCI, there's three or four boxes of records from this gentleman. I'm sorry I don't remember his name. So um, we, we conclude our, our chapter noting that the Robinsons every year, um, the Upper Newport Bay, uh, Conservancy gives an award to the Robinsons, uh, rightly noted. And I think the Robinsons really were the harbingers of the environmental movement that then continued in Orange County for about another 20 or 30 years. So, um, but the other part of it is, as we note in the book, nowhere in the Upper Bay is there a plaque or a sign that indicates that the Irvine Company was involved in the sale of the of the property so we try to work it both ways thank you for your question you're welcome yes ma'am yes i in the earlier part of the history i know they had these all these little bungalow buildings and uh people, whereabouts i that's what i'd like to know <laughs> because they moved them all so a lot of them ended up in santa Ana, and so when they tried to relocate downtown santa Ana from fourth street to the railroad they said they put a lot of those houses little bungalows were all lined up there there were a number of um, structures in what's now the Irvine Ranch Historic Park that were built by the Irvine Company. The general manager's house was there. Maybe this gentleman can tell us about it. Oh, no, I just have a question. Okay, well, let me finish that. Yes. I'm sorry. Um, there, there were structures built a lot, uh, around the Irvine Mansion. There was a, a place for the general manager. There was a bunkhouse. But I'm not familiar with. They movement. described it as a lot of uh, the foreman, one of the early foremen that was there, became a, a, a leader in Santa Ana. Could be. Yeah. And I, it's all I know, but nobody, I, we just found that out kind of by accident. And I just didn't know where all the buildings were. It's like, because they said they moved them all. At one point, Irvin didn't want them there anymore, so they moved them. And I wondered if you had the answer to that. I'm, so not, I'm not sure. Yes, sir. Uh, do you know, uh, it may predate the Irvine Company, but do you know why the uh, main uh, bike trail in Irvine is the San Diego Creek Trail, not the Burbank Creek Trail, or whatever you call it? You know, I think that was a county decision, and I don't know that it, pre it didn't predate the company. That The Irvine Company, to my knowledge, never built bike trails unless the city of Irvine required it. Stan used to work for the county. Do you know Stan? <laughs> Okay. Yes, sir. We had a lecture here one time, and the man told us the uh, Pierre, the architect, was inspired by Disneyland, the circular program. Mm -hmm. um, actually, it's it's an interesting uh, story. A lot of people think that the circle at UCI and the circle at Newport Center were Pereira creations. In fact. Um, the circle at UCI was the um, idea of Clark Kerr, who was the president of the University of California. Kerr, Pereira, and Dan Aldrich were talking about the design of the campus, and Kerr remembered a book written by a German designer named von Thunen, 
and he pulled it out of his uh, library and he got his sketch pad and he drew a circle. And the idea, I'm told, was that way no academic part of the university would have more status than the other. <laughs> nobody would be in front, nobody would be in back. And Newport Center was not designed by William Pereira. It was pretty much designed by Irvine Company planners. Uh, I believe uh, Dan Aldrich didn't come until the campus opened in 1965. Came prior, before. Prior, prior to that, the chancellor, when no, when no class was <clears throat> being offered, was Ivan Hinderocker, who, went, who then went to UC Riverside. I don't think so. Everything I read was that um, Kerr chose Aldrich to be the permanent uh, yeah. Chancellor. Yeah, but Hinderocker was the Chancellor during, uh, I have heard uh, from more than one person that mm -hmm. Hinderocker, whom I knew at, mm -hmm. at Riverside, uh, was the Chancellor during the development stage. Well, I'll, I'll go look. Not, so what I, not what I learned, yeah. Yes, ma'am. Uh, what Rancho did was, did he get it from or whatever, like you were St. Dominguez? But there's another rancho that there were three ranchos that make up the Irvine Ranch. Rancho um, Lomas de Santiago, which is essentially from the five freeway all the way up to the twenty or to the ninety one. Rancho San Joaquin, which is everything south of that to the beach, and then area that would be where the lighter than air base was, Marine Corps Air Station Tustin, kind of in that general vicinity, was a long narrow rectangle that was a portion of Rancho Santa Ana. So two entire ranchos, a portion of a third. Yes, Chris. Uh, how do you think, I'm asking you to get inside of the people's heads, but um, uh, how do you think Pereira and the other original planning team, you know, who, you know the, the company advertised the heck out of the master plan and we have just exactly the right mix figured out and the future figured out, the right mix of residential, this density and that density and the roads and the, you know, versus how much retail and how many schools. And it was just like, we've got the perfect plan and we're implementing it. Um, how do you think those people would feel, I mean, I see change in Irvine all the time. New buildings going up, everything's changing, something torn down, something new goes in. How do you think that those people would feel today to see Irvine as it is now and the changes it's going through? Would they be disappointed that their plan has been changed in various ways, or would they just go, yeah, we, we figured? Um, two couple of ways to answer that. First, Pereira was, a, by self-admission, a dreamer and a, a big thinker. So when you give William Pereira 50,000 acres to plan. He dreams big, he thinks big, and he looks at the whole thing organically, uh, and I'm not enunciating as well as I could. I, th I think Pereira was a guy who, who thought big, and given this assignment, um, he fulfilled it in the best way that he knew how, and that was, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll paint a, a masterpiece on 50,000 acres, but I'll also, being somebody who has to think about how it's going to work, I'm going to identify, well, where's the flood control channel going to be? Where's the transportation going to be? They were working with the realities. The two freeways had met at that time, the 5 and the 405. There were boundaries. The, the hills at both top and bottom kind of formed a natural barrier. The flat land in the middle really made sense as a place to to build. Today, what's fascinating is if you look at this plan, the prayer plan for 1961, about 80%, maybe 85% of what you see on the ground today is pretty much reflective of what Pereira and the Irvine Company did. Now, there are three plans. The Pereira Master Plan, done for the Irvine Company. The Irvine Company Master Plan, approved by the County of Orange, based on what Pereira did. The City of Irvine general plan, created by law and um, subject to amendment on a regular basis. What's happened today that Pereira never envisioned? In the Irvine Industrial Complex around the airport, 18,000 
residential units. Absolute heresy. Absolute heresy. When I worked at the Irvine Company, the Irvine Industrial Complex was industrial, manufacturing. Ultimately, office came, but only reluctantly. Now, 18,000 units in there. Never contemplated, never thought. Think about the Sand Canyon um, complex of medical offices. Kaiser Hospital, Hogue Hospital, now the City of Hope moving in there. And on Jamboree Boulevard, a new hospital being built by UCI. Never contemplated in the original plan. Is it good? Is it bad? Ray Watson was quoted as saying it's, it's a living document. It's kind of a cliche, but you know, ultimately master plans are only as real as the e economics um, allow them to be. So if Ray came back today, if Pereira came back, I think they'd say, you know, I think, I think we did a pretty good job. Other questions? Yes, sir. I arrived in California in the area in 1969, and I remember going down to 405, and almost the only building there was the Fleur building. A little later, but. Yeah. A little later? OK. Uh, was that designed by Pereira? No, different designer. I don't know who it was, but it was not Pereira. Ironically, Pereira didn't do a lot of work on the ranch afterward. Um, he designed Golden West College. He designed um, the Hunt Library up in uh, Fullerton. He did the Ziggurat, which is in Laguna de Gel, uh, which is now for sale if anybody would like to buy it. The government is selling it, but that was a prayer building. But it, Marty Brower, who I worked with at the Irvine Company, um, said that, and Marty had come from an architectural firm, and he said he used to run into prayer, and prayer would say, Marty, can't you get me some work? <laughs> I think what happened was when Ray Watson and Al Trevino, Don Cameron, who worked for um, Pereira, when they got the plan, it was, okay, great, thanks, thanks, uh, Bill, we'll take it from here. And I think they moved things internally inside the company and then kind of created it themselves, but based on the foundation. Prayer. Other questions? Stanley? Mike, you think that the Irvine Ranch affected the way Ray Watson ran the Walt Disney Company? Ray Watson was hired at the Disney Company because of his expertise in real estate, and at that point they were ready to create Epcot. And so from that standpoint, um, it had an influence. If you read the book called The Disney Wars, Ray, at that point, as the chairman of the Disney Company and um, later as um, a board member, really is less involved. He really has much less involvement, which surprised me, frankly. But I'm not sure what was going on in Ray's life at that point. I'm not sure if, I think maybe the, the wars had taken a lot out of him. Ray was not a combative guy. Ray was a guy who thought, by the winning force of my personality, I can make things happen. And in the early days, he had some success in doing that. I have a feeling that probably Hollywood was not Ray's cup of tea in terms of management. But great question, Stan, thank you. Yes, sir. Uh, there was a portion of the Irvine Ranch area in the North, North Park, Northwood, and a lot of the early developments in that area it's not Irvine Company land. That's correct. How did uh, the Irvine Company relate with the developers or in that area to try to unify plan? If we had a, if you have a map of the Irvine Ranch as we used to have in the offices, there was a, a huge piece. I imagine it's hard to see this, but it was all white, and then there were little black spots. <laughs> we call them the window areas because it looked like if you were looking out uh, a wall, there were little bits and pieces of windows. James Irvine II um, allowed some of his tenants to purchase land uh, that they had farmed or had orchards on. And the bulk of it, all of it, was in Northwood. It was above the 5 freeway. So there were, as I remember, 
maybe 12 different landowners up there, 15 perhaps. That's Alpine Group Ranch, and there was a lot of independents that were in that pocket up there. So when the city of Irvine incorporated, um, there came a time when both the Irvine Company and the landowners there in Northwood wanted to create a new village. And so I was a newspaper reporter, I was covering it, that's why I remember it. They came to the city council and said, well look, um, I've got land here, why don't you let me do this and you do that. And the council said, no, no, no. You guys do what the Irvine Company does. All of you get together, hire a planner, put together a plan, and then we'll consider what you do. So the horse trading had to happen within the group as you know, who had the best retail spot, who had another spot. The Irvine Company kind of played a secondary role in it. They had more land that was north of Irvine Boulevard and they waited to develop that, that came later. But um, that was how that happened. One interesting fact, the eucalyptus trees that are up there, in the initial plan when the developers and owners came to the council, most of those trees were gone. City council said, no, no, no. Those trees stay. That's a historic part of our city. You figure out a way to keep them there. And virtually all those windrows are still there. They're getting old and they're coming down, but they're still there. Anybody else? Going once? Chris? Just for one more minute. Maybe you can uh, scotch an old urban legend once and for all. Um, <laughs> The story is the, the reason that there weren't big signs for businesses sticking up, you know, when they're all, all up and down the freeways through LA, where you don't see a Shell Station sign sticking up and a Denny's sign sticking up all along the freeways, a, might be tied to the same reason why anybody who doesn't live or work in Irvine gets lost because <laughs> it's designed to make you get lost. And that all of these things combined together encourage people who don't need to be in Irvine, <laughs> never to get off the freeway, uh, because A, they don't know there's anything there, and B, they know if they get off the freeway at Irvine and they don't know the terrain, they're lost. They, you know, they may never get back home for them. Is that, are those rumors, any, anything to those, or? Well, I'll say this, in the early days when, when the Irvine company was selling houses, there were plenty of signs on the freeway saying, this way to buy a house. Buy houses, yes. yes. Now, the, the answer, I think, the, the serious answer is, again, think about Woodbridge and think about, you know, any place in other parts of Orange County, Los Angeles, not Orange County. There are only three ways to get into Woodbridge. Can't get in from the San Diego Freeway. You can get in from one street on Culver, one street from Irvine Center Drive and one street from Jeffrey. So that was planned and the reason was you didn't want fast traffic going through the middle of the village. There are two uh, roads that go through the village. One is Alton and one is Barranca. But if you want to get to the interior of the village, you go on uh, Yale Loop, drive in, find your way in if you know how to get there, and traffic is slower. Um, the school is at a corner where there's not a lot of cross traffic. So a lot of thought went into that in University Park. The streets meander. That was a big deal, 1965. The streets didn't meander. They went like that. What, what happens when you drive on a street that's meandering? You slow down. So yeah, a lot of the things that you see, the planning for uh, Irvine was so different that the city or that the company had to go to the county and create a new uh, planning or a new zoning code. It was called the Plan Unit Development Zone. So um, the answer is it was not designed to, to keep people out or to <coughs> confuse them. Who came up with these academic names like Harvard, Yale, California, Technology, Michelson from the White Experiments, Von Karman from Rocketry? Uh, you know, uh, it would have been the jurisdiction that had jurisdiction. The county named him when it was county area and it was the city 
who named Someone him afterwards. Came up, come up with the well, the developer typically went to the city and said, we'd like these names, then the city would adopt them. Sir? Yes, I was the engineer for the Turbine Industrial Complex. Well, I'd like to talk to you. <laughs> Right. <clears throat> Sir. Thank you. Side story about Irvine. Until recently, I was a planner at Caltrans, and I went to a lot of re-education uh, <laughs> meetings at Caltrans, teaching me not to design things like Irvine. Ah. <laughs> it's all changed. It's gone full circle. Yes, it's okay. Back to the grid. Big time. Excellent. Excellent. I just like to think I was fine. Good. Other questions. You've been a great audience. If you have other questions, and if you'd like to buy a book, come on up. Thank you so much, Mike. That was wonderful. Thank you all for coming this evening. Thanks to our speaker. Hope to see you all here next month. Uh, always the second Thursday of the month, right here. <laughs>